You know, it's been an interesting week leading up to this passage. And I'm not sure why exactly. It's pretty straightforward. I do feel like there's a bit of weightiness that maybe the enemy would love nothing more than for you and I to be distracted. It is a straightforward text. But I think that there is a bit of warring going on inside our minds, inside of our hearts, maybe even inside of our church, inside our city, our nation, that the enemy is on the move. And you and I must be aware. The enemy is on the prowl, and I promise you that most of the things that we get most discouraged about are things that the enemy can use to distract you from the one thing we should be focused on, and that is the king of all kings, who is Jesus Christ himself. And one of the ways that this can be disrupted so easily among us is that there would be a disruption in unity in the church that belongs to Jesus. Last week, we saw this apex of all texts, in my opinion. It's like one of those texts that you want to memorize, but not just memorize, but to live out. It is in verse 21 that we saw last week. Philippians 121 says, for To me, uh, to live is Christ, and die is gain. It is a forte of what Paul is trying to emphasize in this walk with Christ, in this life that we are to live. And then he goes on and says that, that you are citizens of heaven, therefore you should live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, a, it's an emphasis, but it's also a warning. Because as we see with Paul, that life is so fragile. We see that. In the life of Paul, he had no idea what was coming next. He only knew that most likely his death was imminent. Life It's fragile. We are all facing eternity. And then Paul makes this transition to talk about something that is even more fragile than your own life. He says unity in Christ is even more fragile. When you think about things that are fragile... I automatically go back to my childhood because everything in our home was breakable. And I just remember my mom saying, stop throwing that ball in the house. And when she would talk about these things, she was obviously doing it with love, but, but she talked about me meeting Jesus early and things like that. And so it got awkward, but she meant it out of love. She didn't want me to break anything. There's just fragile things everywhere. You can think about those moments. I remember that me and my best friend growing up, he lived uh, right down the street from us. And we were in his backyard and we were trying to see who could get uh, the rock from the back of the yard to stick and stay on the back porch. Well, I got mine to stay. His stayed, but it went through the back window. Things are fragile. Life is fragile. Glass is fragile. That sports car is fragile. You don't want anybody touching it. Uh, You may be thinking even more deeply, though, that maybe you're facing a marriage that is fragile right now. There's just a fragile nature to your family, emotional fragile. Maybe you are physically fragile. In either way, when we think about unity, we must understand how fragile it is because if we understand how fragile it is, it will help us understand that we must handle it ever more delicately. 
Paul is saying that we must be aware, but you must handle this with velvet hands, with, with delicacy. It is that fragile. This is why over and over again, Paul talks about protecting, pursuing unity in the church. In fact, there was this structure that was put together in 2006 in Kennesaw State University. They put together this million dollar sculpture, okay, by some guy, uh, his last name I can't pronounce, but it's out there and you can look it up. But it's in front of Kennesaw State University, one of their buildings, and he put this, this globe, this sphere together that is signifying uh, the globe, the world. And then uh, what he did was it was covered with 88 pieces of blue Brazilian quartzite. Sounds fancy. But then it was uh, covered on top of that with 2,400 pieces of bronze. It was 15 feet in diameter. It was 175 tons. On top of the globe, you can see, is a life-size figure of David Brower, who was a popular environmentalist. And this is him just hopping and skipping across the world and, and the work that he had done. And they were talking about all that he did to accomplish our understanding of how fragile the earth is. In fact, that this was the point of the sculpture was to show future generations of how fragile the earth is. However, in the greatest irony ever, Three months later, it all fell apart. Here it is. Obviously, they have it cleaned up now, but this was three months after the unveiling. All of that just completely fell apart. And one of the things that uh, I was reading in this article about this sculpture is that they have two theories of what happened. I have one theory. It fell apart, but that wasn't good enough, all right? There are two theories. It came apart because water got into the structure and caused it to collapse. The second theory is that the glue that they used wasn't quite strong enough. There are so many jokes there, but we're just going to move on, all right? The, the glue that they used, it seems like they would use something different. It's fine, all right? I wasn't there. Uh, they didn't call me for any advice. But those are the two theories that they say that this is what caused the collapse, and there is something for us in terms of unity to understand because here's what happens. When the things outside the church begin to infiltrate the church, unity will be disrupted. And when you and I try to come together under a different umbrella other than the spirit of God and the purpose of God himself, then there will be nothing strong enough to keep us together. There are so many things that you and I are drawn to one another in. Some of you like golf, some of you like hunting, some of you like sports cars, some of you like traveling, some of you uh, like all these different things, right? Those things are never gonna keep us together. We have churches who, I, who identify as certain political uh, realms. We have churches who identify with, with a specific type of reformed or charismatic or, or more Presbyterian doctrine and all of these things. Listen, none of those things will keep a church together. It is a glue that is not strong enough. We may think it's good for us. We may think it's gonna keep us together. At the end of the day, unless the spirit of God is binding us together, there will be no no hope of us staying together. There will be no amount of pursuit. There will be no amount of being careful and delicate in how we handle this. There will be absolutely no chance for the church to remain unified. But what Paul says to us today, he says, I have the solution that you need. Paul gives us in two things right here. He gives us instructions on how we can be unified, and he points us to the ultimate unifier, who is Jesus Christ himself. And so if you have your copy of God's word, would you stand with me as we read this passage together? 
in verses 1 through 11 of Philippians chapter 2. If you got it, say got it. Amen. If then there's any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interest of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. God, would you help us understand this passage according to your design, according to your purpose, and according to what you wrote, even though 2,000 years ago, Father, it is still applicable and teaching us today. And so, Father, we thank you that your word is living and active, infallible and inerrant. It is sufficient for us to read and to study and to be changed and transformed by it. So, Father, would you do that today? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated once again. You know, there are many threats to unity that you and I face, uh, just as there are threats to the spaceship Earth of that sculpture that we saw. Uh, But I want to remind you what that Paul has already unpacked a few of those threats. He has already talked about those outside threats. And he is saying, stand firm, stand strong, remain steadfast, even against those who persecute you, even in the midst of those who are against you, those who oppose you. He's saying, stand firm in these things. But it seems and it appears that Paul's more concerned, not with outside opposition, but internal turmoil. He's saying that this is where we must be vigilant. This is where we most best uh, better be cautious in the way that we live with each other, in the way that we uh, interact with one another, that we are that much more careful even than those who are outside of the church opposing us. That's going to happen. That's going to continue to happen. We should expect persecution from opposition. We should expect the world to be against the church. That is normal. But he's saying, but if you really want to reveal gospel power, then be unified. There is no greater display among the church outside of salvation than for the church to be unified. There is no greater display of God's power than for a people to be unified together. Unity does not exist anywhere else. There is no other place that you can go on earth that has this type of true unity. There's no other place. It is only found in the church that belongs to Jesus. And this is what he gives us first. He gives us an understanding of unity uh, by this exhortation. This is where Paul begins in verses one and two is that he is giving an exhortation, a call, an encouragement. He says in verse one, if then there is any encouragement in Christ. I mean, that is a heavy statement right there. 
If there is anything that I can do to encourage you in Christ, be unified. Love each other well. Serve each other well. He goes on. He says, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, he says, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. See, even though the Philippians were facing opposition, Paul's greatest concern was how they were dealing with one another inside the church. And Paul closes his letter to the church at Corinth by expressing a fear that their sins would disrupt their unity. Now, to the church at Rome, Paul encouraged them to be of the same mind according to Christ. He also warned the Galatians to not become boastful and not to challenge or envy one another. To the church at Ephesus, he says this in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. He says, therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. Does that sound familiar? He goes on, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Paul also, Paul also warned the church in Colossae and Thessalonica of the same threats of disunity. This is the calling of the people of God. This is the expectation for the people of God. This is what Paul is encouraging every single one of us to do as followers of Jesus is to live a life of unity. But I have a test for us. All right, so look, this is crowd participation, okay? All at one time, we're gonna give an answer on the count of three, all right? And the question is, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Think about it. And on the count of three, you're gonna say it out loud, all right? Don't be scared, we're doing this together, all right? One, two, three. If you didn't say vanilla, you're wrong, all right? If you said something other than bluebell, get out. I'm kidding, all right? Okay, you all had different answers. That's not a good sign. All right, we're gonna go to a different test, okay? Now, based on the answer of your neighbor, this gives you no right to hit one another, <laughs> to say mean things to each other. But on the count of three, I want you to say your favorite college football team. <laughs> on the count of three, some Aggie over there jumped the gun, all right. On the count of three, one, two, three. Uh, if you did it, no, I'm kidding. All right, no, that's too far. What, what is the point of this test? All of us have different answers. Some of you have the same. Some of you have similar answers. But for the majority of us, we have different answers. And I think I may, I don't see any of my Georgia Bulldog brothers and sisters in here right now. So I may be by myself, but, but does your different answer mean that you are either right or wrong? Some of you are thinking, right. <laughs> okay, but does this mean that we're not unified? Does it mean that we don't have church unity because we have different preferences of who we cheer for? I mean, because for me, it has everything to do with just where I was raised. Uh, for me, I just like vanilla ice cream as long as it's homemade vanilla bluebell ice cream, all right? I just am kind of a plain guy. I don't like stuff in my ice cream. Does that make me right or wrong or over you? Absolutely not. So what is Paul trying to get at when he is giving us a charge for unity? You see, there's clarity here because unity will never mean uniformity because you and I are not gonna agree on college football. We're not gonna agree on what the Cowboys are gonna do today or whether or not we can cheer for them. You talk about something fragile. You talk to a Cowboys fan right now. I mean, it's tough. <laughs> 
But does that mean that we're not unified? You see, Paul, when he says to, to think the same way, to have the same mind, he does not say to, for you to think the same about college football or about ice cream or about favorite pizza or whatever dessert you like. Paul's not talking about that. He's saying you have the same mind as Christ, not as one another. You see, this is the problem that you and I walk into every now and then is that we use our preference as the gospel rather than just understanding that it's just an opinion. Uh, my favorite college sport is just an opinion. It is not the gospel. And so it is with so many preferences that we have inside the church that could disrupt the unity of the church. Did you know that we have people in our church who want us to do nothing but hymns? And then you have people in the church, they want to do nothing but the latest contemporary music. This too is a preference. This is an opinion. So what can we do to unify together? Well, we unify because we don't worry about what year it was written we worry about whether or not it is singing correctly to the Lord, that it is honoring to the Lord. Why? Because we are not worshiping each other, we are worshiping the Lord. And see, these things since the 80s, actually since the 60s of the Jesus movement, and then the 80s and of the 90s, did you know that music has been one of the greatest disruptors within the family of God? And it's absolutely bonkers. What Paul says is that we are to be of the same mind, we are to think the same way, and we are to be intent on one purpose. I praise God that we have so much variety in music in our church. Because here's my preference. My preference is that we would sing nothing, well, I'm not gonna say that. My preference doesn't matter. Nobody ever asks me, kind of hurts my feelings. <laughs> but the truth is, is that the, the intent on, what, on one purpose is what should drive all of us together. Our one purpose, it's been the same since the beginning of creation, to glorify God. Nothing else. We have no other purpose. We have no other point in living but to glorify God, to do everything possible that we would do it together, that we'd remind each other that the point of life is to glorify God, that the mountains speak to the glory of God, the rivers flowing point to the glory of God. In my life, I want it to point to the glory of God, whether we have red carpet or green carpet or hymns or modern music or whether I have uh, blue jeans on, khaki pants, suit, no suit, as long as it's something right? The point is that our lives together would glorify God. You see, there's an expectation from us. This is where Paul goes. He goes from this exhortation to now an expectation in verses three and four, because he's saying, I'm encouraging you to live this way. And now there's an expectation. If you are a follower of Jesus, that this is what it looks like. He says, do nothing not some things, not the things you agree with, not the things that make you happy, but he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Other versions say vain conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. You see, this is a high calling for us. This is a high bar of life, but this is the life that is worthy of the gospel. This is a life that looks as if we are citizens of heaven. <laughs> 
Not just citizens bound to this earth, but citizens bound to Christ himself. And this is what Paul is trying to get across. In order to be unified, we must live personal lives worthy of the gospel, sure. But together, corporately, that we try to outserve one another. We try to outlove one another. We try to outgive one another. And at any moment of disunity that would try to rise up, that we would have a pile of men and women crushing whatever that is to get out of our lives. That we wouldn't allow anything to come up within us that may cause division in not our church, in God's church. That we would be that vigilant that we would see smoke before the fire. That we would understand that our unity is the greatest display of God's power in our church. Not buildings, not finances, not attendance, not great curriculum, not even our, our giving to missions. None of those things are as great as our display of unity in Christ. Unity is what we are called to. We are called to love one another even though there are some more mature, some less mature, some poor, some richer, some who are just saved and some who have been walking with the Lord for years. We are called to love as Christ loved us and loves us. This is what we see in the example of Jesus. You see, Jesus nor Paul, did they just give us this exhortation and do they give us an expectation without an example attached to it? And so Paul points to the greatest example who is Christ himself. And not only does he give us an example, but he teaches us how to live in humility. You see, humility is what is that secret ingredient in order for us to live together. In order for you to, to think of others, in order for me to think of others more than myself, I must have humility. Jesus, when he tells about his own heart, he says that I am humble, I am gentle at heart. And then Paul talks about his humility and one of the greatest ways that scripture could ever prescribe. He says in verse five through eight, he says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to uh, the point of death, even to death on a cross. See, this passage is the apex of Christology. It, it, this is the, the highest peak in scripture for us to come to understand who Christ really is. This is the incarnate Jesus. When Paul summons us to have this same mind, this is the mind that he is calling us to. This is the life that he is calling us to of this type of humility of Christ. This humility of Christ who, who was on the throne, who came down to earth in the form of a babe, in the form of a servant, in the form of human likeness, so that he could take on the sins of the world, bore the sins from you, bore the sins from me, and then go, all the way to a cross, the worst way to die, the most humiliating way to die. And he did it so that you and I could have life. You, you see, this is what Paul is describing here. 
is that we would be so willing to go the extra mile on one another's behalf that there could never be a moment of disruption of unity in our church. Why? Because we are working so hard to serve one another, to love one another, to care for one another. How? In the same way that Christ loved us. The greatest marker of spiritual maturity in your life is the willingness to lay down your preference, to lay down your life, to lay down your opinion, to lay down what you think is best, what you think is right for the sake of the body of Christ so that the body may grow up in maturity together for the glory of God and the advancement of his gospel. This is a mark of spiritual maturity. Nothing else in our lives should matter other than this marker for our church, for our families, and for our own life in the same way that we see this disruption between Cain and Abel. In Genesis chapter four, there's clarity in what is disrupting the unity in the church and the unity in that family. Someone forgot what it meant to live on behalf of his brother. It drove him to envy. It drove him to rivalry. It drove him to murder. And now I'm not suspecting that any one of us are looking to murder, but Jesus says, even if you hate your own heart, you might as well murder. Even if you have this feeling in your heart that you can't sit next to someone, you can't even look at someone in the church, you should have this understanding that there is something going on inside of you that you must get rid of on behalf of Christ. Because here is the truth about being in church together. You see, here in America, we have freedom. We have the freedom to go to the church down the street And we're in East Texas, so you can literally choose between 10 to 15 really great Baptist churches right here. Great churches. And see, this is what happens uh, often, is that we would rather go to the church down the street than for the Lord to reveal sin in my own heart of why I cannot deal with this brother or sister. One of the greatest ways that God exposes sin in my heart is having to deal and having to love and serve and care for God's people. Because so often I am tempted that this is about me. So often I am tempted to fall in this trap of pride and well, why didn't they ask me my opinion on this? Well, why didn't they talk to me? And we can have this pity party together. But really, you know what's happening is God is exposing sin and pride in my heart. And I promise you this, as we serve one another, live with each other, love each other, sin will continue to be exposed in our heart. You know why? Because God is kind and he is gracious to expose our sin rather than let us run off in the ditch in our own sin. So praise God that he exposes it and he uses one another to do that. This gives us the example. We live in humility. We see the way that Christ emptied himself. He emptied himself into humanity. He emptied himself so that we may know him and be saved by him. But I just want to make something very clear because something always comes up in this text that is a mistake, that we think that Jesus became man and was no longer God. This is what is incredible of what John Calvin says about this text. He says, our humility is a bit different than the humility of Christ. You see, because Jesus stooped down, but for us, for us to be humble like Christ, it is for us to stay within an understanding of where we belong, which is low. 
We are not lifted up in that way. We do not, we cannot stoop lower is what John Calvin says about this, but in the same attitude and in the same heart, this is what we must understand, that Jesus lived a life on your behalf so that you may have life. Never once was he not God, never once was he not human while he was here on earth. This is what we see is this hypostatic union of Jesus being God fully and man fully at the same time, never having to to get rid of his nature. That would be impossible, why? Because God is unchanged changeable. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forevermore. And so when we look at this passage, it should thrill us all the more that Jesus, who was God, came in the form of a servant and as a man so that you and I could live bound to Christ and bound together in unity. It is because of this that Jesus will be exalted. This is Christ's exaltation. Look at the way he ends this chapter. He says, for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and the earth, uh, under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, this is what is incredible about when the Lord returns, that we will bow our knee. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord because the same plan is continuing to unfold. You see, when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, it will not be owing finally or decisively to us, but God. And this is God's doing because this is God's intent. This is God's purpose from the beginning in creating and redeeming the world. From beginning to end, his ultimate purpose has been the exaltation of Jesus Christ, the glory of God, and revealing himself so that you and I could have life eternally. You see, this is what binds us together in unity. One Christ, one baptism, one purpose, one spirit who is the spirit of God himself. And this is what keeps us going together, but it requires of us to fully submit to the Lordship of Christ in our lives. Unity is non-existent where Jesus is not Lord. Unity cannot exist in a church that is not committed and submitted to the Lordship of Christ. That is why I thank God for this church. It's because together we are submitted to the Lordship of Christ. We are committed to the advancement of the gospel. And every time we take the Lord's Supper together, do you know what we are symbolizing? Every time we take the elements together, you are saying, I belong to Christ. I remember the cross. I remember the sacrifice that it took, the penalty that I should have paid. You remember that, but we do it corporately so that we can be reminded that the brother and sister on our right, on our left, we are doing this together. We remember together, we are saved together. We are advancing darkness together. We are submitted to the Lordship of Christ together. And so when we do this, when we take of the Lord's Supper, it is a reminder that we are all submitted to the glory of God. That is it. Jesus' prayer for his disciples was that they would display, that they would protect, and that they would pursue unity just as Jesus, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, the Father, God the Father are one. So may the church 
be one together in Christ. I'm going to pray for us, and our deacons are going to come and distribute the elements for us. And I want to encourage you during this time that you are praying and you're asking the Lord, God, would you give me an understanding of my own sin right now? And let's pray that together. Heavenly Father, will you speak to us? God, would you remind us of the need for unity? God, would you remind us of what it takes and what is required for us to have unity in Christ and and unity in our church? And so, Father, we say thank you. God, we praise you that you make a way for us to be united as brothers and sisters together. And I pray that we would do everything possible to pursue that and to protect that just as you have called us to do. Father, thank you that you use brothers and sisters in this church and in our lives to expose our hearts, to expose our faults. And I pray that right now as we prepare to take these elements, God, that you would help us understand whether or not we are truly saved and what sin we have to confess to you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.